Hi. Okay, good. It works. Fantastic. Okay, so indeed, I have, uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be here on stage uh, with you uh, in this theater. And uh, I was indeed uh, invited to talk about the dark side of the universe. As you have heard, uh, essentially, uh, we would like to know, in general, what is uh, our universe made of. And among the numbers we are going to discuss today, there is 5%. So 5% is not much, right? I mean, if you go to sale and you know that this, whatever, shirt has 5% reduction, it's a bit small, right? 5% is actually uh, the amount of ordinary matter that we have in the universe. Ordinary matter is us, is the matter we are made of, the matter that we see. All the rest, we actually don't know much about it. It's the dark side of the universe. We actually know a bunch of stuff. I would first like to discuss a little bit how we got to this number, this 5%. Actually, in the early 90s, Einstein came with uh, the theory of general relativity. And a little bit later, a bunch of physicists uh, tried to find some solution to these equations, and they put the basis of the theory of an expanding universe. Among them, there was Alexander Friedman in Russia. And on our side, there was Georges Lemaitre from Leuven in Belgium. They both got, I mean, to the conclusion that there should be a possibility to have an expanding universe. And this was not very well seen in the scientific community. 1929, Edwin Hubble observes some galaxies. And he realized that these galaxies are moving away from us. And actually, the further they are from us, the faster they are moving away. This is essentially the picture that he is observing. Expansion. If you want to be a little bit more quantitative, you would look at velocities as a function of distances, you put your different data, and you try, try to draw some physics relationship between them. The first thing I would say to a student in the lab, if he show me this plot, is where is the error bars? But actually, this is the plot that is in the paper of Hubble. So um, he got to the conclusion that there is indeed a relationship between velocity and distances. And he got a constant here that up until now, is called the Hubble constant. And indeed, the universe is expanding. This is the first pillar of a theory, of an ensemble of things that allow us to draw this uh, conclusion that ordinary matter, we don't make much of the universe. Ah, I didn't touch the computer. <laughs> ah, very bad. OK. <laughs> so on this invisible slide, <laughs> you would see um, Pentheus and Wilson, which were two guys working on a radio telescope for a telecom company. And um, Pentheus and Wilson observed a radio noise. This noise was coming from every single direction, exactly in the same way, very uniform signal. And it was also coming day and night. And the question was, what is this signal? But actually, other people were looking for this signal. And it happened that this signal corresponds to the cosmic microwave background. What is the cosmic microwave background? The cosmic microwave background corresponds actually to a light that was released from the dense and compact and hot soup of the early universe at the time where the universe became transparent to the light. So you have originally some nuclei, some positive charges, 
flying away together with negative charges, electrons, and at some point they are going to combine and form neutral atoms. This is what we call recombination time, and this is where the cosmic microwave background has been released. It has been released when the universe was 380,000 years old. It was still a young universe. More quantitatively, here you see in this figure the intensity of the signal that has been observed as a function of its frequency. For um, visible color, frequency would correspond to the color uh, of the light. I mean, here we are a radio signal, so it's different, just the frequency of the wave that you observe. Um, when you see this plot, you see that there are some thickness of the plot here. They are actually data points. And notice, there is error bars here. Actually, there are also error bars there, but you cannot see them because they are really, really too small to be seen on this plot. Okay? This is to tell you that this is a very precise measurement of the cosmic microwave background spectrum. And it actually tells you that this spectrum is a black body spectrum. Black body spectrum means that our universe was in thermal equilibrium at early times. And actually, the height of this peak tells you that uh, the temperature of the photon in the universe today is 2.75 Kelvin, meaning minus 270 degrees Celsius, meaning today the universe is very cold. That's not all. You have this fantastic, beautiful, uniform and isotropic noise, radio noise, but already in the 17s, a bunch of people, again, some Russian and other people from different places, realized independently that there could be small imperfection on the top of this signal. Actually, fluctuations of temperature in the sky at the level of, I mean, five orders of magnitude below the signal. And it's actually in 1992, with the Kobe satellite, that we could get the first details of these fluctuations. And um, it was a fantastic discovery that allows to, uh, us to get a lot of conclusion uh, and give rise to the Nobel Prize of Matter and Smooth in 2006. I forgot to say, the observation of the cosmic microwave background by Penzias and Wilson also gave rise to a Nobel Prize, much early on. This is going to be a psychedelic uh, talk. So, more quantitatively, I show you, apparently he doesn't like the simple plot, he likes the color, okay? So, this is the map of the fluctuation of temperature. Actually, we can look at, we, we can characterize this distribution, look at the variance of this distribution as a function of the angular scale. Take it as fluctuation temperature square on this axis. And this is the angular scale. Big angular scale, big angles in the sky are there. Small angles in the skies are there. Again, you have data points with error bars from Planck, 2015. And we see that we have an interesting pattern. We see acoustic oscillation. Actually, this acoustic oscillation comes from the fact that this radiation that we see in the early universe was in equilibrium with the ordinary matter. The matter that feels gravity and tends to crash on itself. And on the other hand, the photons that are strongly coupling to this matter that try to push everything away by pressure. So you have this effect. Pressure, pressure out, gravity. Pressure out, gravity. Okay? You see acoustic oscillation directly on the distribution of the photon that we see in the sky. And obviously, as I'm telling you, gravity gives that, pressure gives that. This gives you an information on the component of your universe, on the amount of matter that you have in your universe. Actually, the amount of matter coupled to photons, in particular in this case, which is 5% of the total content of the universe. In order to get the fantastic line here, continuous line, that beautifully goes through all the data points. 
This is the second pillar of our theory of expanding universe, the cosmic microwave background. Third pillar, haha, invisible again. <laughs> On this slide, invisible, you should see the Mendeleev ta table. I don't know if I go fast, ha, you see it appearing, right? I try again, Pla. no, not this time, okay. So you might remember that from your chemistry courses. I didn't like the Mendeleev table. It's a big table. You have all the elements ordered by the, uh, their atomic numbers. And actually, there, there is hydrogen. And there, there is helium. And if you see the plot, they were actually different colors of the others. These elements have been produced. Aha, again, an invisible slide. OK, I will continue like that. So <laughs> these elements, these light elements, um, have been produced in the early universe um, when the universe actually became, I'm just going to try to play a little bit with the connector. Mm. And like, like me, OK. So um, actually, before the cosmic microwave background was released, we actually uh, got the possibility to form nuclei. So I said, atoms, they are made of nuclei together with uh, an electron, at least for hydrogen. Um, but you, you first have to make the nuclei, OK? So hydrogen, one nucleon. Uh, deuterium, a proton and a neutron. They bind together, form the neutron. They can do extra, uh, I mean, you can put together two deuterium, get helium hydrogen three, and then add another interaction, and you get to helium. This was possible three minutes after the beginning of the history of the universe. Three minutes. This is called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. This idea was put out in uh, 1948 by Alpher and Gamow. And actually, Gamow is a funny guy, like many physicists, you will see. I mean, they have a lot of imagination. Um, I mean, they found it fun to write the paper with a third guy, just for the name, that was called Beat. So the paper is called the Alpha, Beta, Gamma paper. Alpha, Beat, Gamow. And in this paper, they put, I mean, the basis of the idea that you could actually produce nuclei in the early universe. Obviously, not everybody was agreeing with that, but here what you see is uh, the abundance of uh, different nuclei. So here I have helium, I have uh, deuterium, I have lithium. Okay, abundance of nuclei as a function of the baryon density. Ordinary matter, we usually call it baryons. So this is ordinary matter density. The line we draw here are models that we get from our theory. And the box that you see here is observation of light nuclei in places in the universe where stars could not have produced these nuclei. Because actually, obviously, there were the people that were thinking that the nuclei were formed in the early universe, and the other that were convinced that the universe was static and that all nuclei were formed in stars. So in regions that are poor with stars, you have these data, OK? And then the line, the band here, you see is written W map. W map is another satellite that has been looking for cosmic microwave background. And the nice thing is that they actually nicely agree with each other. So not only cosmic microwave background tells you that there is 5% of ordinary matter in the universe, but also the observation of light nuclei that we have, that were produced three minutes after the beginning of the history of the universe, during Big Bang nucleosynthesis, agree with, completely agree with this information. This was the third pillar of our theory. This theory, together, I mean, putting all these pillars, we get the Big Bang theory. My joke is burned. Ah, not that one, okay? Not that Big Bang theory, even though the, I mean, the se I hate this, this series because when I look at the series, I have the impression to see my colleague all the time, especially this guy. <laughs> so don't ask me much about it, but it, it's, it's, it's a very good series. Okay, so what is Big Bang? Really? So Big Bang tells you that your universe 
has been expanding all the time since it was born. Okay, no? Okay. Big Bang. Uh, so, originally, universe very dense, very hot. Today, universe completely expanded. We are 13.8 billion years later. Just for, like, French-speaking people, billions means milliards, okay? So it's a lot. Uh, the temperature is very cold, remember, minus 270 degrees. And actually, Big Bang was actually a joke made by a guy that really didn't like this theory of expanding universe. And, I mean, in, a radio for, uh, in, in some radio, uh, I, I think it's BBC, uh, uh, he, he said, I mean, look, I mean, these people that are talking about the Big Bang, like a shit, right? Okay, but this theory is actually working very well without the Big Bang. So this guy was working on a nucleosynthesis into stars, and he was thinking that the universe was static. But you cannot account for the cosmic microwave background with these kind of theories. Okay, so let me go through the history of the universe. We already had some clues of what happened during the first 380,000 years. First, you had Big Bang nucleosynthesis, three minutes after the beginning of the history of the universe. After 380,000 years, the universe expanded it enough for nuclei to come together with uh, negative charges and form neutral atoms. Okay, so this was again the beautiful map of the cosmic microwave background, temperature fluctuations. Ah, again, the acoustic oscillations. And as I was telling you before, these acoustic oscillations, they keep the information about this gravitational effect versus pressure effect. So they tell you an information about the amount of baryon versus the amount of photons. But they also tell you about how much gravitational pull you needed for this acoustic oscillation to happen. So actually, there is a fingerprint into this acoustic oscillation about the total amount of matter. And it happened that we not only need our 5% ordinary matter, but we need another component that do not interact much with light. At least it must interact much more feebly or weakly. Uh, than ordinary matter, and this is dark matter. So in our universe, thanks to the analysis of the cosmic microwave background, we can tell that we need 5% ordinary matter and 27% of dark matter. You directly see that dark matter is much more present than ordinary matter, than us. There is actually more data that we can extract on the history of our universe. Already before, the cosmic microwave background was released when the universe was at age of about 10,000 years. CMB is 380,000 years. Late, I mean, when it was 380,000 years. We actually have had, so we have perturbation temperature related to perturbation, inhomogeneities in matter, okay? The inhomogeneities have been able to grow at the moment where actually matter overcome radiation in the early universe. And these inhomogeneities are going to become nonlinear and give rise to the large-scale structure we see in the sky today. Galaxy surveys are going to essentially look at all the galaxies we have in the sky, and they are going to make map of these galaxies. You, you are not getting a bit uh, tired by these images? So I don't know if there is a solution. Ha. Huh. So this is the map of galaxy surveys that you have seen blinking. So actually in this map, let me try to go back. Ha <laughs> ha. There are 60,000, 70,000 galaxies shown in this map observed by the SDSS, Lone Digital Sky Survey. All these points are uh, little galaxies. Actually, I mean, before this survey, which is actually uh, still taking data, there were previous surveys. You see here the 2DF GRS that was going back in time of a few billion years and was showing the distribution 
of galaxies in the sky. And here I show you the results of uh, the first uh, simulation, which were dark matter only driven. Okay, so you only have like big, so several solar masses, points, okay, acting together with gravity. You put them in a big box, you wait a little bit of time, and you get this. Looks very similar, right? So you could really reproduce the cosmic web thanks to dark matter only simulation. This was obtained in 1985. Today, we are much, much further than that. We are not doing dark matter only simulation, but people are taking into account the effect of baryons, uh, which in particular allow us to create real galaxies. Okay, we need baryons. There are there are luminous. There is luminous matter in galaxies. Okay, so you need it at some point to really reproduce up to very to to scale at the size of galaxies. You need them in the simulation, which is very very. Um, computationally expensive. On the top of this very big galaxy survey, actually this galaxy survey allows us to observe very particular stars, supernovae, the supernovae uh, stars. So this is a galaxy, and actually within the galaxy, this galaxy is a bit larger than just this disk that you see. There is a big explosion of a star. Superlumino sorry, supernovae are actually very luminous objects. They are luminous as 5,000 billion suns. Um, their existence is related to the explosion of a very massive star. And actually, because they are very luminous, they allow us to probe the universe much further than these faint galaxies that Hubble was putting on his plot without error bars. You remember this, this line. Using them, we could actually show that the universe is currently in a period of accelerated expansion recently. This gave rise to the Nobel Prize in 2011. So summarizing, taking all these data together, I have cosmic microwaves white brown, I have galaxy surveys, so this is what I was trying to show you, LDSS data, all points are galaxies like that, and supernovae data. We put everything together and or pi of the content of the universe beautifully agrees on the fact that there would be 5% of ordinary matter interacting with light, so this is us, 27% dark matter responsible for the formation of the big structure of the universe, and 68% of dark energy, a component that will give rise to uh, accelerated expansion much recently in the history of the universe. Great. I want to focus on dark matter because this is essentially, uh, this is something I have been working a lot. Uh, and there are actually other hints, previous to cosmic microwave background, of the existence of dark matter. Already in the 30s, people were looking at the motion of galaxies into clusters of galaxies, and they realized that there was a problem of missing mass. Later on, in the 70s, Ford and Vera Rubin, a woman physicist, I think she was not paid when she was working. It was considered as normal. Um, right, no, I mean, why to pay a woman? So, um, they were looking at the rotational velocity of stars as a function of their distance. So, I mean, okay, here there are no data exactly on this plot, but you can imagine there would be data points and they are appearing here. What do you see? You see a curve that rises, so the rotational velocity seems to increase from the center of the galaxy to the outskirts of the galaxy. But actually, thanks to 21 centimeter line, we can go further than the optical. And we can look at the rotational velocity of stars further than the disk and realize that the rotational velocity of these stars flattens out. If the rotational velocity of these stars were related to the amount of matter that is in the visible part of the galaxy, the curve should go down. This mismatch is related, potentially, to a missing mass, a mass 
that doesn't interact with light, that we cannot see, but that would be responsible for this rotational velocity of stars far from the center. Okay, let's try again. No. So, you have to imagine, I'm going to back to this slide because I cannot go to the other one. So our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 20 kilo per sec size, kilo per sec, 10 to the, I think it's kilo per sec, 10 to the 19 kilometers, okay, it's a lot. And actually, in order to explain this flattening of rotation curve, you need a halo of dark matter that wouldn't be as a disk. It would be a sphere, okay, a black sphere around this galaxy that would give rise to this flattening of the curve. Our galaxy is surrounded by a halo which radius is one order of magnitude larger than the size of the disk. Oh, this one also doesn't work? Okay, you won't see the bullet cluster. That's a p ah, ah, ha, ha, you have seen it. <laughs> okay, let's try again. Ah. So, ah, in this flashy image you see, maybe you will see it more. Uh, aha, you saw a guy, pa! Okay, so that's the point. You can imagine two clusters of galaxy. One cluster that boah, goes through the other one. No, that one. Maybe it will flash again. There is one cluster of galaxy that goes against the other, okay? People have been able to observe that. You really see like a bullet, the bullet cluster, the other cluster that is there. You can see this cluster in optical. So you can see it with the light that we all see, okay? So you see a mass there and a mass there. Then actually you can use weak lensing. Lensing effect is, I mean, an effect where light is bended by the existence of mass, okay? You don't, uh, you can reproduce the amount of matter you have because light has been bended, essentially. And actually, you can see with these bullet clusters, there is not only one, but many that are observed, uh, that the position of uh, the mass is not where we see the bullet. And the reason for this is because what we see is visible matter. This matter interacts with light. Actually, it also interacts with, each, with itself, okay? While dark matter interacts very weakly. So this makes that it is possible to have dark matter there, while the two clusters part made of ordinary matter have more difficulties to pass through each other. This kind of images that you cannot see is actually one of the big problems of uh, theories of modified gravity that try to explain uh, the rotation curves of galaxies due to a modification of gravity at the place where is the matter. But when you see the gravitational potential at a different place than where is the light, you have a problem, okay? That's not the only problem that they have. They can actually not account for CMB either. Okay, so what is dark matter? We don't know. What we know, dark matter is dark. It means that essentially it should be electromagnetically neutral. It should not interact with light. Actually, it's not completely true. You're still allowed to have a few percent of dark matter that would have a charge one million times smaller than the one of the electron. Second, we know that dark matter should be massive and cold. Why? People have been actually able to run simulation, and as I showed you, these simulations were reproducing the cosmic web uh, very well, okay? But this was actually using cold dark matter. So you have these filaments and these clusters of galaxies that are appearing here. You can do exactly the same kind of simulation 
assuming that dark matter is actually not completely cold. What does that mean, hot dark matter? It would be a kind of dark matter that would be able to have a certain velocity at the time of structural information, a high velocity. Actually, here they have been using particles of dark matter that would be 0.25 electron volt. One proton is nine order of magnitude heavier than this, okay? So it's very, very light dark matter candidate. And if you have this light dark matter candidate into, I mean, you take into account the fact that dark matter could be flying away for gravitational potential, which is essentially what is happening, what happens is that you cannot reproduce the structure that you see in the universe. So this is why we know that dark matter should be massive and cold. Actually, it's not completely true. Dark matter could still be warm, okay? We'd mean not hot, but not cold, okay? So something in between. Okay, last point. The, the other thing that we know is that dark matter is still around. We have a bunch of observations, as I showed you, that dates back from the epoch where the universe became transparent to the light up until today that tell us there is dark matter around us. So dark matter cannot have disappeared in between. So it should have a lifetime that is larger than the age of the universe. We also know what dark matter is not. So, dark matter is not antimatter. What is antimatter? So, let's imagine you have a charged particle here. What is its antiparticle? Its antiparticle is a particle that has exactly the same mass, exactly the same properties, except that it has the opposite charge under electromagnetism. So, for example, an electron and a positron, okay? Problem is, when the electron and the positron, they come together, they give light, okay? So if our galaxy was surrounded by antimatter, we would have a region somewhere where we would have interaction and a lot of light. Dark matter is not antimatter. Is dark matter macho? So macho is not that guy, disappeared. Ha. It's actually a massive compact halo object. It happened that we know that essentially dark matter cannot be made of baryonic matter. It cannot be made of a massive compact object that would be made of baryonic matter, of stars. But actually, we still have the possibility to have dark matter made of some black holes, particular black holes that we call primordial black holes. So what is a black hole? It's a region of space-time where gravity is so strong that nothing can go out, okay? No particle, no radiation. When I was giving some similar talk 10 years ago, I was essentially saying that the black hole was coming, I mean, essentially appearing at the end of the life of a very massive star. But actually, it's not completely correct. You can actually form black holes way before any stars has ever appeared. You can form black holes before the cosmic microwave background was emitted. You can form black hole in the 10 to the minus 32 second after Big Bang. So 10 to the minus 32 is zero with 32, zero after the virgule or the comma, and one, okay? So in a very short time after the Big Bang, you could have produced a uh, curvature perturbation, very large curvature perturbation, that will give rise to primordial black holes, which are not made of baryonic matter, essentially, and that were born way, way before the first stars, which appear here, uh, appear in the history of the universe. And, uh, so why are we coming back to this? I mean, why did I change my story in between in these 10 years? Is actually because we have been observing directly gravitational waves. Uh, you might have heard that, it was in 2015. The LIGO Observatory has seen gravitational waves, so ripples in the space-time that arise from the coalescence of two binary black holes that enter, end up colliding together and forming a new black hole. This gave rise to a Nobel Prize in 2017. Actually, today, they have seen 19 events, more than 90 events, 
and that are represented here. Here is uh, the mass of the objects that could be like coalescing together to give a new object. The blue points are all black holes. Orange points are neutron stars. And you see that there are some halfway points. We don't know exactly if it's a black hole or if it's a neutron star. And actually, this is very relevant for primordial black holes because these black holes in particular could have solar mass size, while a uh, black hole for, from stars is more difficult. But I mean, as soon as you give a problem to a physicist, they will find out the solution. So maybe it's possible. I don't know. But this would be a clear uh, one of the possibilities to see these primordial black holes. And they could still account for all the dark matter if you have a distribution of mass of them. We also know that dark matter is not a known particle. These are the particles that we know of. This is the standard model of particle physics. Many things in this. You have quarks, three families, up and down quark, they, for, they bind together to form protons and neutrons. At the bottom here, you have leptons. Among these guys, you have the electron that you know. I mean, the electron comes with the proton and form hydrogen. You have two other friends that have the same charge but different masses, the muon and the two, which are also leptons. Here, you have gauge bosons. So you have the gluon, the photon, the photon you know. I mean, this guy cannot be the dark matter. And uh, so this guy is responsible for strong interaction. These guys are responsible for weak interactions. And then here we have the Higgs boson. While this image is static, you can see here that there is an entry that is the charge, OK? The up quark is a charge 2 thirds. The electron has a charge minus 1. Dark matter should be neutral. OK, these guys have disappeared. They cannot be the dark matter. We are left with the gauge bosons. These guys, they mediate interaction. They have been observed. They interact sometimes very strongly with matter. They cannot be the dark matter. This guy, the Higgs boson, you might have heard of him also. If you were in Belgium in 2017, you might have heard of François Angler, Robert Braut, and on the hand, um, a guy from England, uh, Peter Higgs. In the 1960s, they could get uh, to a theory that would give rise to the masses of all the particles of the standard model, even the one that disappear here on, this, on, the, on, the, on the slide. So and this, this mechanism is called the mechanism of Brot Angler X, and it gave rise to a Nobel Prize for Francois Angler and Peter Higgs, because unfortunately, Robert Brot passed away uh, before that. So these guys, we have observed them. They interact with all the particles, they give masses to the particles, they cannot be the dark matter. We are left with the neutrinos. Neutrinos are very good candidates for dark matter. They have zero charge, they interact very, very weakly with anything. They could be the dark matter. The only problem is that we don't know their mass, we don't know exactly their mass, but we have an upper bound. We know that their mass should be smaller than two electron volt from particle physics experiment and 0.12 electron volt from cosmology. And we, when you put the amount of neutrino you should have, you multiply by the mass, you get their energy density. And at the end of the day, you get way too small amount of abundance to account for all the dark matter. So dark matter is not a known particle. What could be the dark matter? The dark matter could be an extra new particle. This is the scenario I like. Definitively, it should be charge zero. What is its mass? What is its spin? Should be a fermion, a boson? We don't know. Everything is possible. About its mass, this is a logarithmic scale. It goes from 10 to the minus 30 electron volt. I recall one electron volt is uh, nine order of magnitude below the mass of the proton up to microscopic masses, 10 to the 40 kilos, larger uh, than the sun, 40, one with 40 zeros, OK? Um, this is the range of possibilities for dark matter mass. It's very large. 
Uh, on the lightest part, you have axions. On the highest part, you have primordial black holes. In between, you have steroid neutrinos. Would be the friend of the neutrino, but would not interact with the gauge boson, the W and the Z, as the standard model neutrinos. Dark matter could also be a WIMP. WIMP means weakly interacting massive particle. It also means this very weak guy that is <laughs> trying to fight against this macho. But actually, nowadays, it's much more plausible that dark matter is a WIMP, and it's certainly not a macho. Aha. These are many possibilities. Actually, we have plenty of possibilities for dark matter. Could be an action, could be a whim, could be asymmetric dark matter, could be steroid neutrino, inner dark matter, strongly interacting massive particle. I mean, you have many possibilities, and I'm certainly not going to bore you going through all these details. I'm just going to try to give you an idea of how we try uh, to look for the properties of dark matter beyond its gravitational interaction. Because right now, the only thing we have had is dark matter giving rise to this gravitational pull that forms structure that give rise to a certain distribution of temperature fluctuation in the CMB that changes the rotation curve of galaxies uh, that makes that all the matter is situated elsewhere than the light in bullet clusters. The way we try to look for dark matter is essentially break it, shake it, make it. So, break it. Take, for example, two dark matter particles and collide them together. If, I mean, in, in any model, in any theory of particle physics going beyond the standard model, you are essentially going to get new interactions, essentially. Even very weak, you, are, you should be able, at some point, to interact with ordinary matter, these blue, uh, sorry, these white dots here. So you could potentially look for annihilation uh, final state uh, from dark matter uh, in the sky. I mean, in dwarf galaxies, in the center of our galaxy, from the sun. There are different uh, experiments looking for the signature. These final states would be neutrinos, photons, Cosmic ray particles, so antiparticles. Uh, many uh, possibilities here. Fermi is one uh, telescope looking for uh, gamma rays. And when you try again to be a bit quantitative about this, what you do is you look at the probability of annihilation of your dark matter. And you can draw, I mean, you can look at different masses. Uh, you are going to have your experiment that has going to, uh, to have a certain sensitivity to this probability of um, annihilation. Unfortunately, we have no conclusive signal of specific annihilation final state from dark matter. So everything you are going to do is to draw a line in this parameter space, and everything that is above the line is excluded. This is the current status. Interestingly, dark matter, when it annihilates, what it can also do is inject energy but in particular, charged particle in the early universe, at the time where the cosmic microwave background was released, at the time where supposedly there are no extra uh, charged particle in the bath and photons can travel. If the dark matter annihilates around the time where a cosmic microwave was emitted, it's going to mess up my beautiful peaks I had before. And this gives rise to another constraint on dark matter annihilation, versus mass. Weakly interacting massive particle, in some cases, have, have a very good prediction and necessarily be excluded for masses uh, below a few, GEV, few hundreds of GeV in some scenarios. Shake it. What you can do is you can also expect, I mean, we are surrounded by dark matter, so they are flying around, they are passing through you, to me. These particles, they could very well kick standard model particle, or, or even more nuclei, in underground detector. And we can look at the displacement of this, uh, uh, this, this nuclei. We can look at light emission into the detector and try again to put constraints on the properties of dark matter. Again, from this kind of uh, experiment, which is called direct detection experiment, we don't have any 
conclusive signature about dark matter. Another way to go is to try to make dark matter. So you have standard model particle, you crush them against each other, and you hope that at some point you are going to generate some dark matter particle. This is what people are testing in collider experiments, like for example the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And again, they have not seen anything. So putting together these break it, shake it, make it um, processes, we typically get to a certain region of the parameter space that is just right now excluded. So we don't know what is dark matter, but we already know a lot of what dark matter cannot be. So, we have no conclusive evidence for dark matter yet. Just for the fun, I would like to tell you what I'm working on right now. So, what I'm working on that right now, I told you that we have information about many stuff at the very early stage of the universe, when the universe was like up to 380,000 years old. We have information on the history of the universe thanks to galaxy surveys that are probing the history of the universe here. Actually, currently, we are having a new possibility to test the history of the universe thanks to 21 centimeter cosmology. What is 21 centimeter cosmology? The idea is essentially, I told you, you remember this picture you could not see with hydrogen and helium? Okay, so hydrogen makes in the early universe, 75% of the total content of ordinary matter in the universe. This means that you, can, you have clouds of hydrogen, of neutral hydrogen around, okay? And in these clouds of neutral hydrogen, you can have some transition, okay, between two uh, ground state energy of hydrogen that can give rise to the emission or the absorption of a photon of a wavelength of 21 centimeter that actually corresponds to a photon of a frequency of 1,420 megahertz. This photon is going to be redshifted, and uh, I mean, this absorption or emission of photons is going to be able to be observed today in radio signal again. In order to have uh, this observation of this, I mean, the, this, this transition to happen, you need something to kick, essentially, your hydrogen clouds, okay? The source is the cosmic microwave background, is a radio signal, okay? You have a certain background, you pass through a hydrogen cloud that you cannot very well see, and you have some signal that goes out, you compare what goes out from what goes in, and you have a difference of brightness, okay? This difference of brightness is shown here as a function of the redshift. This is a simulation. Um, here, you essentially see the perturbation in this differential brightness temperature along uh, the history universe going from giga years, so about now, okay, to when the universe was only 20 million years old, okay? This different, this part of the history of the universe, we expect to have rayonization. Actually, I told you that the uh, photon, uh, sorry, the um, nucleons bind together with electrons to form neutral atoms at some point in the history of the universe, when the universe was, yeah, few, giga years, few uh, billion years, uh, they have been breaking apart again due to stars. Uh, this is rayonization. We don't know much about rayonization, so we hope to know better when we will have detected this signal. Actually, even earlier, we have X-ray heating. Stars heat the intergalactic medium. And even before, you have stars that are going to emit limb and alpha photons and that are going to give rise to uh, absorption of the background signal. What essentially we are going to detect, I mean, we are going to have these maps and we are going to be able to extract this information. This is the equivalent of the cosmic microwave background black body signal, okay? For the black body, it was this bump, okay? For 21 centimeter, we expect to see this line, absorption, emission. We, also can see, we will also be looking at the distribution of fluctuation, and we will get this kind of uh, 
fluctuation temperature distribution as a function of redshift and as a function of scale, tri three-dimensional information. CMB is information only in, one, in 2D. You have the sky, two dimension. We will have this information at different epochs. So we will have three-dimensional information. It will tell us a lot about this period of the history universe, about the astrophysics, but also potentially about the dark matter properties. So this story is to be continued. I thank you very much for your attention.